lack of female perspective concerned me, and I have to admit I felt slightly afraid. My already niggling concerns about the implications of entering into a male-dominated profession, why are there so few women, what happens to us out there, were amplified by the fact that there were no female voices to answer my questions or let us know how, actually, we might work around the issues that prevent so many women from progressing in this career. So I approached Samir with the intention of highlighting this issue and unsure what his response would be. As it turned out, he was totally receptive and agreed that we needed to make sure that the next series would not be woman free. The next day, Samir contacted Siobhan and me because we'd both been to a chapter here among the notes to each other um, and suggested that we all meet up to discuss the matter further and make a plan of action. And that led us to organise today's session. Uh, thank you, Lee. Um, my thoughts were, I think you alluded to pretty much along the same lines. Um, as students returning to university after professional placement, we're in a good position to reflect on our experiences here. Um, the professional studies lectures were a great place to do this, and so I hope this lecture will carry on that tradition. Um, having undertaken two years of experience myself, I've come to know that I've come to notice small instances where, as a woman, I felt I was being treated differently. I also couldn't help but notice that the career progression of the female architects in my office didn't mirror that of their male colleagues. This led me to question why. And um, why is it that only 12% of architects that are registered in the UK are women? And why, uh, when we as part two students, get 50 50, um, has something gone wrong and is something still going wrong? And um, we hope that today will be a friendly discussion about sexism and architectural practice through which we can create awareness and even um, maybe some. The afternoon will work as follows. Each of our two speakers will give their short presentations in turn. There will be a panel discussion, uh, and hopefully, then everyone will have a chance to ask any questions of the architects and the insights into the topic. Uh, so, speaking today, we have the architect Sharon Elizabeth, Polly Porter, and Amy Scott. Um, Sarah Wood has worked her own practice based in London and is Professor of Architecture. She has a reputation for designing expressive, sustainable environments and making everyday worlds extraordinary. Her practice has completed award-winning buildings for education, culture, dwelling and community. Sarah is the co-author of several books and has lectured globally. Sarah was awarded an MBE for services to architecture in 2003 and was honoured with the award of RDI in 2005. Hello, Doctor. director of Holly is the architecture at Cambridge and then the Royal College of Art. Her architectural projects include work uh, at a mix of scales from houses, schools, mixed with development, residential to market and she worked in the UK, Amsterdam and Singapore. Before founding Circuit Chair, she was a senior partner at KPS for four years. As well as being passionate about design, Holly enjoys communicating architecture to the wider public and does so through her lectures and archives. She is a fellow at the Royal and Daisy Froud is co-founder of Architecture Practice AOC, Agents of Change, where she leads the firm's participatory arm. Having trained as a linguist, she now works as an interpreter of places and of ideas and knowledge about places. With 40 years experience in stakeholder engagement and collaborative planning, she focuses on devising tools and strategies that allow multiple voices to meaningfully contribute to design decision-making processes. A qualified translator, Daisy studied languages at Cambridge and an MA in cultural memory, and teaches on the history and theory of urban change at Bartlett. She recently completed a visiting professorship at Yale with AOC, running a seminar course on participatory architecture alongside a design studio. Daisy also sits on design review panels for the London Boroughs of Hackney and Lewisham, member of Reaver's Building Future Steering Group and a built environment expert for Design Council for Okay, so I'll pass to
slightly upstaging me. Um, so I'm Daisy Froudy, and my architecture practice is called AOC. I set it up with three architects. I'm not an architect. This picture is really, I suppose, the emblem of our practice, and that what I like about it is a pigeon on top of the Empire State Building. It's this idea that quite ordinary things actually are incredibly valuable. You just look at them in a slightly different way from a different perspective. But the work our practice does is all about engaging with the everyday, with the mess, the way that things actually are, and thinking how you respond and react productively to that. Um, so agents of change is uh, the main thing that AOC stands for when we chose the name. It was very much with this idea that it could mean a number of things at different stages in our practice. Again, part of this philosophy of being reactive and responsive to the world rather than coming with a set identity that you force upon the world. As a practice, we're very interested in processes of what we call sampling and synthesizing. So we don't really believe in that there's an original creator who comes up with ideas from the middle of nowhere. We believe that in all forms of cultural production, what we're all doing all the time, and of course language, my discipline is a real example of this, is draw on existing symbols and cultural references and combine and interpret these in new ways. So you don't get new things. It's just they're not as new as some people might like to claim. So uh, this is a case of um, Lutchen, this famous English architect, sampling the front of St Paul's in order to make the British school a row, which is quite an extraordinary collage of, of different sample bits of building. Although we often use uh, more contemporary references to the idea of the, the sampling musician, that you can make something extraordinary by engaging with the world and thinking about the collective experience that you generate through your particular kind so some of our work, we do a lot of schools. This is Spa School, a, a new building for a, a, um, children who are high up on the autism spectrum in Southwark. Uh, so this school is something that was directly influenced. We, we have a very strong community engagement focus. So we have an idea that we will get a better design if we really talk to the different people who live around our buildings, who know their area intimately, and of course who use our buildings they have a different kind of, of knowledge and expertise that we can tap into. And, you know, when I began my career in my early 20s, it's probably worth saying I'm in my late 30s now, so, so I think that's useful in terms of what we get to discussing sexism, the generation that you belong to. Um, but when I started working, it was at this bottom-up level, simply running these community engagement projects to try and allow people to have a say about the generation of their estates. So in this case, uh, when we submitted a building for planning that was red brick, um, the community who lived around the school hated it so much that we ended up running um, quite a positive uh, community engagement process with them. Uh, and this term is a bit of jargon, community engagement, but I much prefer it to consultation at least, which is simply an idea that you go to the community. And community itself is an incredibly loaded term because there is no such thing as a community around um, where we were. There's a whole diverse group of people. All of this I'll come on to in, in addressing sexism. Um, so we ran a very structured process that really valued people's intelligence and ability to think about what would be the best possible brick colour and brick type at school. And we ended up with something that actually we too felt was a lot better. It wasn't what the main protesters about the red brick wanted initially, and it wasn't what we wanted initially, but by really discussing what was right for the area, we got a better scheme. We work a lot with models. Um, we try and design things um, rather than high pollutant models, models that people can really take apart and, and use to design with us and to think about the spaces we're making and, and when possible we test things out at one to one. We do do some residential projects. Again, we don't do very many of these and they're always about an opportunity to engage with the culture of a particular family, their kind of family life and find ways to reinterpret and, and, and sample that. Uh, this family love the architecture of so. And um, we're very interested in the ways in which non-architects change the world around them. So in terms of our research, we're interested in looking at building typologies where actually architects have played very little role, perhaps at the start, but inhabitants are able to transform them. So the semi-detached, the classic British semi-detached is a really interesting example of that. Um, so there's another school project, Fry's Primary School. I'm going to just, we were asked to give you a bit of a sample of so I think I'm just going to jump through those briefly. But um, again, we always try and design spaces that have a strong character. We do believe that spaces that do say something to you are those that are actually the ones that are most easy to 
to inhabit in your own way as a user. I don't really think that the empty white box is a particularly um, suggestive or interesting response. We try to make interesting spaces but that are very much designed to accommodate their users, in this case the small children in this school, and to allow them to transform in different ways. So everything about this particular room is designed to be able to easily take applications of other things or to be misused. So here's a storage cupboard being used as a den by very small people. And again, very simple graphics that we try and be able to make things, to not just produce architectural drawings as a way of talking about things, but to think what's the best way that we can discuss these ideas graphically. Um, this is a project for uh, a demountable theatre and performance space called The Lift, which we did a few years ago, that was designed collaboratively. So we were the designers, but the brief was built with 12 different community groups from across London, all ages, abilities, and backgrounds. It was quite a complicated process. Um, and then we tested this whole building one-to-one. -one. That's something we called a priority event, where people helped us take key decisions about where those resources would go. And the pattern in the end was something that was, we used a, a, a patchwork quilt pattern for multiple hands, so many, many people coloured in the pattern it was meant to have a different scheme. And we don't just do buildings, we design games and processes. So this is something called the Building Futures Game. We use a workshop in a box that allows people to plan out possible future scenarios for their neighbourhood for the next 10 years over the course of an afternoon. A lot of the work that we do in design, we design bespoke games to run with people's, in this case, again, children in the primary school. And then this is one of our most recent projects. So we've just got planning permission for this housing and community centre in Nunhead in South London. So we do do classic architecture as well. I'm quite, we're, we've been there for a decade, and I'm quite happy now with the way it's panned out in terms of the diversity of the project. Um, this is Personally, 
that I guess I have certain qualities that might traditionally be called male qualities. Again, that's through the education I've been lucky enough to receive. So I'm argumentative, I don't have a problem speaking up for myself, I can be quite aggressive. None of these are saying good qualities. So all this is not to dismiss the facts and figures for actual architects. But for me, the issues that linger around the sexism in architecture are much more of a structural kind, by which I mean they are embedded in the structures of society. One of them is to do with a certain kind of masculine culture rather than male culture, by which I mean there are certain ways of behaving that we would culturally say those are male ways of behaving and those are female ways of behaving. It doesn't mean that any of the men and women in, those room, in this room behave in that way necessarily, but we do call them masculine and feminine. And masculine culture is really pervasive within architecture. It's there in the crypts, the whole way that you're trained to defend yourself and use rhetorical argument rather than to collaborate. It's there in the focus on individual working and the individual creator. It's there in the aggressive and that almost commando culture of many architecture practices with the late nights and the, the battling to win. You know, you watch something like Mad Men. It's so like an architecture practice, so many people love that. But that culture is destructive to people of both genders. In my practice, the three people who have left when they've had children have all been men. Because they are young men who've grown up feeling equal to women, believing in equality, not wanting to play the traditional male role. And they've said, hang on, I want to be at home being a father, not just turning up late at night and seeing my kids on weekends. I want to maybe work from home and have that different quality of life. So that's what I feel quite strongly. It's, a, it's an issue about the second masculine culture that has to be tackled. Um, that culture is very much tied to a previous historical period when men did have a lot more power in the UK. And I'm not, men certainly have a lot more power internationally now. But legally here they don't have so much. What I do think we need in architecture is definitely more diversity in terms of representation of the broad range of people who are in the world in architecture practices. That's not to say that I think you can only design for people like you, whatever that means. That would be nonsense. It would mean empathy cannot exist. But it does mean that we need to be open to broader forms of experience and engagement. So there is a traditional dynamic in architecture which you still see around you today once you're in practice architect knowing best, acting benevolently in a paternalistic way to use another male loaded term to people. Um, and that is not a great dynamic in terms of an architect user relationship. I do think that if you can get into practices, people from a broader range of backgrounds with a broader range of experience, then you will have a better conversation not only in the practice but also with your users who produce better buildings in response. So I think that is definitely something that needs to be tackled. And that is about changing very practical issues about how practice happens, which relates to the masculine culture. Um, the final point I want to make is it's worth concluding that I am very much a feminist. I know there's an awful lot of debate again for some reason about whether feminism is appropriate or not, and women younger than me saying I'm not a feminist, I am a feminist. Um, I'm well aware, going back to that discussion about generations, that my freedoms and possibilities are very recently one thing. And the terrifying thing about the, cu the current British administration for a start is we've all seen how quickly things that we assume are now embedded, such as the NHS, free health care, a certain duty of care towards poorer people in society, can be eroded very, very fast. And a lot of women's rights are a lot newer in the UK than some of those things that have now been changed. So I feel as if these are all cultural decisions that women are now equal, and those are as vulnerable as anything else unless they're defended. And certainly outside the UK, the world is rife with examples of women not being equal. Um, so I'd say never undervalue that would be my message, that I'm very conscious of never undervaluing the opportunities history and geography have given me. Um, in terms of how it implies that I don't campaign, I have to admit, I, don't, I am not somebody I'm sure we're going to hear any more interesting things like people that Holly actively do, but certainly we're actively trying to change our practice culture to make it more open, diverse, non-masculine in its behaviour. And I do, both through my teaching and practice, try and um, support younger women and hope that they will stay into the pra in practice and, and try and make a small change in our own way some of the statistics that we're aware of about people in this So that's my initial sally. Um, over to Holly.
when you were, I was looking at role models and when I was going to go into architecture, obviously um, Charlotte Perriand is an example of someone that I looked up to and thought was inspirational. And professionally, I'm very lucky to have some fantastic clients that are women. I've got uh, Senna Atkins, who's in the centre of the frame here, who's one of the clients we're working with on a series of projects. Sarah Banger and Sarah Fox are both fantastic women that are fantastic clients in the industry. Um, Ethan Drickner is someone that professionally I have a lot of respect for. So I think, you know, for me, they've been big influences in how I perceive the industry and how I want it to be in the future. And then on a personal note, um, I think I have the influence of the wonderful mother, luckily, and I had a baby about nine months ago. So um, lots of influences in my life, I think, which have taken me where I am today. Um, so when I started working, I said um, they touched lines at Cambridge and I went to the RCA. I actually worked for a big practice. I worked for KPF both in London and New York because I felt I wanted to get that kind of commercial experience. I must say my experience was very positive there. Um, I think similar to Daisy, I think particularly in your 20s as a woman, it's not a problem. You're absolutely equal, absolutely no problems at all. Respectively, you'll be doing exactly the same as your male counterpart. You can work those long hours, you can do all those you know, seven days a week things. And it's a fantastic experience. So I did that probably for about four or five years. Um, and then I decided I wanted to set up my own practice. Um, and I met um, a friend of mine, Pascal Shura, who I set up the practice with. And we started in schools, because at that time, schools was kind of the boom industry and building schools for the future. But before we got into buildings, we started off questioning what the profession was like. And one of the questions we were asking is about you know, why are there not more people that go out in their early 20s our businesses, you know, where are these people, are there other people doing what we're doing? And so to kick that in investigation off, we launched a magazine called Injection, which we published through the AJ, the Architect Journal, where I had a column at the time. And the magazine was really about different ways of thinking and looking at different forms of practice. The AOC was one of the practices we prayed for. So that was our first um, sort of gambit into an independent uh, world of work. Um, we did quite a bit of work with Building Magazine, lots of wrote lots of articles and then started to get commissions off the back of it. Um, but one of the other things that uh, we felt when we started off as these two women was that we couldn't really see any female role models right at the beginning. Um, that we could say, okay, well that's how we want to feel, these are the types of clients we want to have. So we decided to set up something called Chicks and Bricks um, and it is effectively a networking opportunity for women in the construction industries. And what I felt when I went into um, architecture and construction is I felt very positive about being a woman in this profession. And a lot of the groups that I met were quite negative about it. There was a lot of negativity about being a woman in, in architecture. So I wanted to create something that was slightly tongue-in-cheek. It was positive and it was about celebrating where women were in the construction industry rather than focusing on the, focusing on the negatives. And what was interesting is we got a very, very high... Um, I suppose, response in terms of young women being interested in this, and that's something that Daisy touched on. There's a, there's a bit of an issue at the moment with women, I suppose, in their early 20s, not wanting to be seen as feminists. So this was, this was an organisation that was a lot of fun. We did events at the top of the Gherkin, the events at the RCA. About 200 people turned up, and we had Patricia Stewart speaking at the first one, Sarah Fox, who was a client on the Gherkin, speaking at the second one. And it was an opportunity for people to network and, um, and speak to each other, but it was a safe space, and people felt comfortable that was a great thing, I think, for us um, to do. We also got to meet our role models. So, lesson for me was, if you can't see them in the industry, go out there and try and find them, um, if that's the best way to approach it. So, I run a practice called Service to Air, as I've touched on before. Um, interestingly, about three years ago, my business partner at the time left, so I now run it on my own. Um, another thing I'd say as a woman, when you're running a business or even as a man, is, you know, you can have a plan, you stick to it, but, you know, things happen, stuff changes. And the main thing is you have to just keep going and keep moving forward because you know you will find a way through it in the end. So it's a difficult time when my business partner left, but actually it's, it's worked out fine now. Um, we have a range of projects, probably from about 1 million to about 30 million in the budget. Um, team of 14 staff. Um, I mean, we've been going for about a decade now as well, so I feel like we're kind of established. We've worked probably about 300 schools in the UK, um, and that's growing at the moment. But currently designed 23 schools books, and eight of which will be due for completion in December. So, interesting, I think, group of projects we've got. And I think a fantastic workforce. I mean, one thing when we're recruiting staff is that we try and look for a gender balance in the environment. I don't think having all women or all men is a sort of health environment for anyone to work in. So, um, we always try and get a 50-50 split, and that works very well. 
love for us and will probably be a fantastic group of people. Um, as an example to some of the projects we've worked on, uh, different school projects, uh, some of them mentioned there as well. So our key clients, um, so we're working with a lot of boroughs in London, um, also a lot of contractors um, who we do design process projects for as well. So I'm just going to touch briefly on uh, three projects that we've um, been working on. Um, first of all, product architecture. One thing that happened after the BSF, BSF bubble burst is that the price um, that you have to build to a school project pays in half. So you went from having projects at about £2,000 a square metre to having buildings at about £1,000. The current figure is £1,113 a square metre. So your price point was very, very difficult to deliver quality architecture at. So we decided to go down the product route and look at modular construction and ways that we could effectively get some quality into that low price point in the schools sector. So we've uh, got a relationship, uh, an exclusive contract with Paul's Cabin for the next four years to basically develop their solution to create schools. Um, and they have to be passive, they have to be um, very, very good environments. And it's about factory built quality and control over the quality of those environments, which unfortunately in the school sector you just don't get when you're doing stuff traditionally on site. So it's a way for us to bring some quality back in. So we've taken them through quite a long process about you know, other, other industries and how they create good quality products and how that can apply to what they're producing. So we've spent a lot of time looking at Mini and um, Fiat in terms of how they have a basic chassis and how you can configure elements to create and personalise spaces. <coughs> and we've used all of this to develop um, basically a toolkit for them to, um, to develop these schools. So we've got some typologies that we've worked with them on, the fan atrium, street, courtyard, and we've effectively developed an online tool that we're going to be launching uh, in eight weeks' time for people in schools to be able to configure their own schools online uh, and create um, also an idea of price points. So, tied into this, uh, there are different options in terms of finishes that you can have and types of packages you can go for. Um, and we've got, as I said, eight schools completing at Christmas, um, and of those, I think six of them modular construction. So, these are just some examples of the modules. Uh, we've done and are currently going under at the moment and working on those. So um, at the other end of the spectrum we're doing some quite large schools, um, one of which is Falcon Dagger Free School, which is about 20,000 square metres, so it's a big school. It's a 10 form entry, so you've got about 300 students per year. Um, it's on quite an interesting site, which is a Riverside Generation site. Um, it's quite a deprived area, elements of the and then so the school will be the first building that goes up and the idea is with that. And the infrastructure that's getting added in, they're putting a new station in down here and crossrails down here. This school site will start to activate and kick off hopefully all the regeneration around it and become a real um, hub of the community. So we're responsible for effectively keying into the master plan and creating a big secondary school here and a primary and SEN school here with a load of sports facilities as well going around it. So you just again it's quite early days i try to pick projects that are in process at the moment um quite an efficient floor plan again we're doing mixed modes of construction on this some of it's traditional some of it's modular um to mix of things but it's a big big single site and then the idea is it's centered around these courtyards which allow natural air and uh, ventilation through into the spaces now so um, the third project i'm going to touch on is tottenham hotspur technical college which is interesting it's actually a we're not actually in the stadium, <laughs> we're in the little building on the right hand side um, and we're fitting out two floors because they're sponsoring a technical college um, and the idea is technical college and preparing students for working in the real work environment um, and the great thing about this is the clients are very innovative and they don't want walls, they want to have everything over the plan, they want to model workplace environments and the status that they're creating. In the early days here we're working quite hard to look at private um, and public spaces and how we separate those, looking at kind of workplace environments that we've worked on previously. Um, we've done a lot of zoning work with them. We're at the stage now where we've started to kind of formulate the floor plate. Um, the enterprise zones are these key spaces in the centre um, where the project based learning takes place and then more discrete spaces around the edges on the side. Um, we've spent a lot of time, um, I mean, the, process, the design process for us is very important as well, looking at kind of sizes of uh, groups that we're working with and the types of settings, and then from those types of settings, we've generated the number of spaces that we're going to need to create. And the floor plate effectively revolves around this nexus, we're calling it for them, uh, effectively a central compass point to the floor plate, um, which will serve as both a marketing suite and a heart of the scheme. Um, and in the centre of that, you have a forum space where the students can use for informal conversations, presentations, um, and ways to um, basically engage. And this is 
things I just wanted to talk through in relation to this issue about sexism and architecture. Um, I mean, my view is that fundamentally, I think it's a good time to be an architect in the UK, it's a good time to be a female architect in the UK for the reasons that Dave has talked about before. But I think the big decision that you have to make as a woman is when you come out of your 20s and into your 30s, you decide you want to have a family, how are you going to manage that? Because the long hours um, and pay levels are not brilliant. And you have to have a plan. So my view is have a plan, stick to the plan, don't deviate from the plan unless something comes up um, where you need to adapt um, and change. But fundamentally, you have to have a strategy and you have to know where you're going and stick to your career um, and stick as close to that as you possibly can. I mean, for example, I knew I wanted to run my own business. I didn't know necessarily how big I wanted it to be, where I wanted it to be, but I knew I had that aim and what I wanted it to feel like when I went to work. And you know, a lot of things change, your business partner might disappear, you know, someone else new might come in, whatever happens, but you just have to keep going with your plan. And you know, we lost a lot of work with BSF Flats, we're now back up to 14 people, and you just keep going. So that would be quite cool one of my biggest pieces of advice. I think also, as a woman, I just say in my experience, don't be afraid to speak up. You know, my, my view is that uh, actually the reason a lot of women don't get more pay rises is because they don't ask them as frequently as their male counterparts. So you know, don't be afraid to go and ask for a pay rise, not the staff that you're asking for it, go and ask for it. And also don't be afraid to kind of bring up your opinions and meet it, because that's absolutely not the wrong with just saying what you think. Um, and I think, yeah, dealing with alpha males in the industry, um, this is some advice that I was given, and I take it on board and it works, which is get ugly early. So what I mean by that is um, if you're dealing with bullies, you're dealing with any kind of macho characters, so they can be male or they can be female, you push back very early, you push back and you're really, really firm, you get ugly, and you can be as nice as you possibly want to be after that's happened, because then you've shown your teeth, they know what you're like, and you can be as nice as you want to be for the rest of the project. And that's got me out of a lot of difficult situations and difficult contractors. So it's a good, um, good piece of advice, which you may not understand until you stop dealing with some of the characters you deal with. <laughs> Um, I think also actively seek out your role models. You know, some people are afraid, you know, if you have someone that you admire that you think is interesting, call them up, ask them to go for lunch, you know, they're not going to say no. And it's really, really important that you meet these people and you hear what they have to say. You know, Chicks Bricks was an amazing thing for me because I got to meet all these incredible women. Um, and it gives you something to aim for and also contact in the industry as you move forward. You know, you should definitely go out there and just invite people for lunch. They, they'll always come. Um, Find a mentor that's been there and done it before. That's what I did. Um, it's immensely important. Um, and it doesn't mean I'm a male or a female, it's whoever you respect. But you know, find somebody in the industry that you know is doing stuff and has done it well. You know, whether, whatever sex that's in, it's kind of irrelevant. It's just someone that you respect. And um, we've had a mentor all the way through and it's been immensely valuable, so I can't, I can't tell you enough that that's important. And then the last point I've mentioned before, but you know, you make a plan and you stick to it. But don't be afraid of
um, feel that the whole sort of statistics and numbers issue is really a symptom of the problem rather than being, uh, you know, something much deeper and sort of structural, an analysis of what's structurally going on within our industry. And of course, I'm not, by saying that, decrying the fact that I think numbers of women in architecture and wage levels and the overlooking that clearly goes on and the discrepancies in pay and so forth are not important. Of course, they're very, very important. Um, and they're important to get, it's important to get women into the industry, but I do also think that numbers alone are not going to make that much difference. And I think there are some really interesting issues around all of that, which is that it's true that professions that have a very large number of women tend to be the kind of low status professions like teaching and nursing and social work and things like that. And actually, in a way, what I think might be a really bad thing about having lots and lots of women in architecture is a downgrading of our profession, which is already very weak and where our wages are incredibly low. So that's something we have to be very careful to guard against. So what I'm saying is the numbers issue is not the full story. I also think that actually women really need to take control over the situation. And of course, that's very, very difficult because in the end, we're very largely socialized to be very compliant, which is the reason we don't ask for the pay rises and we don't put ourselves forward for promotion and all the other things and make demands of our practices and uh, put the mirror up against them to, you know, to defend the practices which are obviously sexist, which they indulge in. I really feel that, in a way, women need to grow up and not be infantilized and take back control of the situation. And no one is going to do that for them, so they really have to step forward and, and up to the plate. Um, and I think that one of the very difficult things, certainly I had when I was a young architect, was that um, I actually found it very difficult to identify with the male-run practices in which I found myself. So, in other words, what I'm talking about is a kind of culture around architecture. Daisy mentioned it earlier. But it's about seeing your future sort of potential mapped out for you in front of you. And I personally didn't see that, didn't find that at all in any of the practices that I work for. And clearly, I mean, there may be all sorts of other issues like my personality or whatever as well, but I think it's really interesting that I work for a number of practices and in none of them did I feel, I feel comfortable here or I feel that I could stay here despite lots of people uh, dangling carrots at me and being uh, tempting me to stay on and if I did, I might become a partner and this and that and the other. So it seemed to me like there was something quite basic about the culture in which I found myself which wasn't reflecting my value system. And I think those are the key things which need to change. Um, so the F word is an interesting one. Daisy mentioned it. And again, I'm a little bit surprised, given the kind of resurgence of interest in feminism, that more of us are not declaring ourselves as believing in equal rights for men and women. That's what feminism is. So that seems to be a very straightforward thing that we all desire. Um, and I don't understand why more people are kind of not jumping off the fence. Um, and I think that feminism is useful because in my experience as both an academic, a teacher, and somebody who runs her own practices, is that often young women are really paralyzed because actually they don't have the tools for deconstructing the situation they find themselves in. I was in that position when I was a young architect as well. And it was only really through dint of sort of a lot of hard work on my own part that I, I acquired the tools to sort of understand what was going on around me. And I think that's what feminism helps you do. Now, there were a number of consequences of that, which is that um, once you understand the world as a feminist, you know, you understand about the concepts of sort of gendered identities and how, you know, the masculine way of thinking predicates ideas of singularity, of um, objectivity and of binarisms which divide the world into male and female. Um, they take, because of singularity, 
and the kind of axis around which everything operates. Authorship is seen as a single-minded thing. <coughs> and, um, you know, it's the Howard Raw kind of idea about the sort of um, purity of a single person's genius idea, which is actually so contradictory to mostly what we understand of as being the key things in architecture. I'm actually, I've forgotten why I put this slide up, but this is because the, this is a roll call of women in architecture, and I was actually wondering how many people were able to identify these people. Because I think one of the key things about understanding your position as a female in architecture is to actually uncover some of the history of women and their struggles in architecture. How many people know all the people here? How many know two people on this roster? Not many. I am pretty shocked by that. And actually, you know, I think reclaiming women's experience in architecture is terribly, terribly important. These are really pioneering and groundbreaking women that nobody knows about. And so, as a basic, a starting point, understanding and reclaiming our own history is really, really important. You all know the Rockian figure, the guy with his erection in front of him, um, who's taking sole authorship and intensely in love with his project because um, he won't let it be built if it's go if the concept will be destroyed and this is precisely the kind of issue around the um, masculine figure in architecture which we're all fighting against and although of course this is sort of kind of a laughable cliche actually it's amazing how prevalent and long uh, lived this myth continues to be, and I really think we need to fight this and develop a new image for what architects are. Um, so this idea of the kind of heroic and the, kind of, uh, the abstraction also, this idea of objectivity and uh, that, you know, architecture is a sort of uh, something up there and not at the ground level where you're dealing with people because they're messy and they get in the way, all the things that Daisy's talked about, about the work of AOC. You know, this is what's rolled into the image of Howard Rourke. And he does, you know, the precious, the one-off, the monumental, the high-end pieces of architecture, um, as opposed to working in the everyday. You know, it's actually the everyday which sullies everything and destroys this conception of unity. And at the same time, it's also associated with the concentration on the visual dimension of architecture, i.e. that thing that's in a picture plane over there, which is um, is this kind of perfect product, which, um, you know, is, again, it's the conception of the individual. It's not a lived, sensory, messy, dirty world that we're contingent, that we're all having to deal with. Um, and, uh, and so it's a sort of perspectival um, thing, which is the product of this way of thinking. And I think this is a value system which we really need to change. So, I mean, for my part, doing a lot of reading around it is really important, and this is a, a very um, important piece of work by matrix architects. Matrix don't exist anymore because they were a product of a very particular kind. But um, they, they had a really important message to make, and in fact, what's interesting about this book is it's actually a collection of essays. It's not by one person. It's by lots of different women with different perspectives, all putting forward the problems that they foresaw they, they were encountering as being architects, mothers, uh, citizens, etc., in the public realm. Um, so I think, and I think this critique of values is really, really important. And I mean, the point about uh, diversity and inclusivity is to be more accepting about these other ways of thinking and doing, which make architecture a, a richer place. I mean, one of my particular bugbears as a leader of my own practice is the way in which, which is, like, I think, also a sort of masculinist way of thinking about architecture. Everything is about the competition and the concept of a winner, a single winner who takes all, as opposed to being a sort of collaborative uh, where, you know, workers share the ground and more equal. And in a way, it's also rolling with capitalism, obviously, as well. And it's very exclusive, it's very wasteful, um, and there's a, a real lack of diversity in that, which of course is what our cities are founded on after all. 
Um, I think the other issue around all of that is the whole thing of risk management, where danger is seen as different and difficult and risky and all the rest of it. So as a female offering something different, you're seen as somebody who is really difficult to deal with. And actually, my perception as a leader of a female practice is that we are often seen as something quite difficult and quite edgy, and we don't mirror the value system of the people on the other side that are giving out the work. So that hampers our development because we're not seen as something which is um, normal. Um, and so, and, and I also think it's true that in my practice, people who have entered my practice sometimes have seen me as a very odd leader because actually my role of leadership is not to be the great person leading from the front, but actually to gather people together, value their experience, get them to take responsibility for themselves and guide them in that self-discovery process. But that's not what a lot of people want out of a leader. They're expecting somebody to tell them what to do. But I think that's a very masculine way of thinking about the world, and I don't do it. So that's a very big problem for certain people who enter my practice. And all of these things are around how we operate as something different out there in the field. Um, so one of the things that came out of Matrix, actually, was the attempt to design a building by women for women. And this is the Jaganari Center in one of its early incarnations down in Whitechapel. I don't know if you know it, but it's for a bunch of uh, Bengali women down there. And, um, okay, it's kind of uh, East Asian stylistically, but the whole idea was to try and make a building which reflected the culture and the diversity that was um, resident with these women who basically are sort of behind screens and various cultural references like that. And I think, um, and I think that this was quite highly criticised, thank you, um, because, again, because of the way that it looks. And I was really interested when I authored Desiring Practices. We had, um, we, somebody in the te Daily Telegraph got hold of the fact that we were running a conference about architecture and gender, and we got rung up by a guy from the Telegraph who started to quiz me about what we were doing, about raising gender to, uh, on the agenda within the RIBA. And, and the article that finally ended up in the Telegraph was this. How, it was, it was titled, the, 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 the title of the article was, How They'll Tell Whether Your Building Is Gay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I mean, a very salacious twist on what we're saying, but the issue being, you know, that somehow by looking at the building, you could tell what gender it was. And I think the, and it, and it goes back to this issue I was talking about, about how the emphasis on the visual is something which is incredibly, I think, a masculine way of thinking about the world. And actually it's the lived experience which is the most important critique of that kind of thinking, which as a woman, I want to embed in the culture of our practice. So in my practice, we're interested in asking questions around patronage, about who commissions the buildings and why they commission them. Obviously money is held by certain groups in society and very, very often they're in the hands of men. Actually, I have found my best experiences working in architecture have been when we have women clients. But you don't often find women with, with, with independent wealth we work mainly in the public sector, so a lot of our work, uh, where we encounter women, there are things like the head teachers of schools and things like that. Um, we, okay, <laughs> we, um, as I, I talked about leadership and I talked about the idea of the sensory, when we designed Stock Orchard Street, it was a um, overtly um, autobiographical, uh, feminist project because what it was attempted to do is make a very sensory environment, one where you, didn't, you couldn't understand it except by moving around it, one where the materials were all about self-help and self-build, so they were asking questions about the slickness and the, um, the sort of singular vision that normally exists in architecture. It was um, making a building which was actually combining high and low technologies, it was making a hairy building, I mean it was kind of 
putting out on show a lot of the things which generally get packed away because they're not slick and they're not seen as very beautiful. Uh, and these are, were very deliberate critiques of the way in which architecture is configured. Subsequently, I mean, we've sort of become known really for this idea of the sensory. And, you know, I'm not ashamed of that. I think that's a really interesting world to occupy in architecture. Um, but it doesn't win us very many commissions, and a lot of people perceive it to be difficult or expensive or problematic because it involves a lot of consultation, things that people don't really want to pay for. And I would say, you know, our biggest, um, the biggest message I would give any woman um, entering architecture would be that you need persistence. And you also need confidence because you're going to have a very rocky ride. I don't say that lightly. And in fact, when I say that in the University of Sheffield, I'm told to shut up because actually we don't want to tell young women that it's going to be really tough out there. But I think you need to know that because if you go out ill-equipped to deal with what you're going to have to face, then we are selling you short. And I think you need to understand what, what, what's going on out there. I think there is a bit of a conspiracy of silence, and I want to tell it straight. Masculine qualities versus feminine qualities in people in architecture, whether they're male or female. Um, and I think uh, the collaborative approach to practice is one which has proven to be successful. So why do you think that the more masculine rhetoric, rhetorical argument um, remains the kind of the more prevalent approach in practice? <laughs> Because I think we're quite unusual. We're, we're not like the mainstream. But I think we're, you know, by that we're marginal, really, in the way that we think. Um, do you think? Um, do you think that sort of what Trace is saying maybe stems from the way architecture is taught in architecture school? Do you think that was touched a little bit um, in terms of like careers and things like that, and whether working differently in education? I think that's definitely true, and you know, I, I teach in the School of Architecture, which is very, very overtly feminised itself about 15 years ago, and we abolished the crit, and now the reviews are run, they're not called crits anymore, they're called reviews, and they're run by the students for the students, so it's self-help, and the tutors are there, but they sit on the sidelines. Uh, we also had an overtly feminist tutor in year one who set the, the tone for the rest of the school. Um, we've had a female head twice now, and we have more female professors in Sheffield than we have male professors. Um, and it's very clear that we're running a school where we are overturning traditional notions of what it means to practice. And we stress the collaborative and the communicative and all that rest of it. And if I were to be really, really critical of the uh, the education that we've got, I'd say we're not producing the greatest of designers. But hey, we're producing real human beings who know what architecture is likely to be all about. They're reforging the idea of what the architect is, and I think that's really good. We'll wait and see what happens. You know, they're just coming through now. I think my, my response to that would be, I mean, my understanding of that is you're saying that, you know, why is the masculine approach to architecture is so prevalent still. You know, I think actually it's a wider issue, not just about architecture, yeah. it's about construction. So, yeah. you know, architecture, I mean, if you talk to most guys, most contractors, you know, they think all architects are completely, you know, you know way with the fairies and very feminine, and, you know, it's all creative, and actually you know, it's a completely different world when you get into construction. And for me, that's where I think the masculinity is driven from, because the nature of construction is very, you know, still very male. And again, we're working with some great female um, senior contracts managers now, but they are they are rare, yeah. um, and I think that is always the challenge you have. But I think you know you've got to see it as a challenge. As, as Sarah said, you can't you know just duck the issue and not engage with it. You know you have to see the challenge. You want to make a go of it. You have to take it head on and, and dive on in there and try and make a difference. So it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, I mean I'd also add to that exactly the same answer that obviously you know architects are a relatively small 
um, profession within the construction industry, and we have relatively little power. And I guess that's quite a positive thing someone was talking to me about the other day, in that once actually, you know, I went into architecture because I sensed that most of the political issues I, were inter I was interested in were played out in space. And I was very frustrated as somebody working at a community level by the architects, not really listening to the intelligence that we were gathering on the ground, working with people. And then I met architects who were interested and thought, well, that's great, we can work well. Having been in architecture for 10 years, I think I've become very conscious of actually, you know, architects have very little decision-making power about those bigger spatial issues, who decides what happens to space, who holds power over space. And that getting more involved in proper, pure politics is where you get to do that. And someone was saying to me the other day that actually, if you do trace, it's not all bad news, women dropping out of architecture, because a lot of them remain in the broader sector, yeah. but do move into that more political world where they are influencing space. They're just not designing buildings for it, but they're using some of those, what you might say, the feminine qualities, the feminine ways of working, that we are still acculturated to, to a certain degree. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I certainly was to a certain degree taught to be a bit more collaborative, a bit more apologetic, a bit more nice than um, the men that I set up my practice with. But those qualities are very useful in, in a certain kind of negotiate, political negotiation. So women do end up in those things. Yeah, over there. Yeah, um, I sector because that was the biggest market around so you know we made a commercial decision on you know you've got to enter, you know, I would be a good architect so I'm interested in architecture I'll do lots of different things but that was where the projects were so that's why we went to enter that and I think you know I think it is yeah I think it's an interesting point that we are actually all showing school projects but I think you know those skills of engagement and communication and community and you know they, they can all be applied in any sector I think I mean for, for me personally it was just what was around at the time and that was an opportunity which we did the most with. I think I mean also I should say the three architects I set up with you know they're all male um, but we are very drawn to those um, to school community cultural institution type projects and we've been lucky enough to do them but I think that's less about perhaps being better suited to them in terms of anyone's temperament and more that those are the projects that allow us to engage with the really complex community of use and we've done the odd pitch for more kind of corporate work but it just always slightly jars because people want their symbol building and we're not that interested in doing a symbol building we want to understand the culture of the institution and the community so um, it, I guess you, you, you find the things that engage you um, and yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't say that it's a, a kind of, either in terms of, you know, biological gender or culture gender, as that anyone is more suited to anything else, but I think you're definitely drawn to things that, to work on, that match your own interests and, yeah, ways that you want to work. Any more questions? Oh, well, I was going to say, I mean, I think, um, I think there is a kind of hidden hierarchy or an unacknowledged hierarchy in the kinds of, uh, of a pecking order of kind of what's seen as a status project, let's put it that way. I mean, up there would be the sort of art galleries and that kind of thing, you know, the sort of thing that Cruises St. John do or Dark does, you know. And 
than then kind of slick new office blocks and corporate headquarters, that sort of stuff. And sort of, and I think, you know, the work that we're all interested in is actually about the sort of grassroots stuff, really. And I mean, I think your question is interesting because I would say that, you know, the value system, that's a kind of uber thing, that's a sort of uh, a societal, uh, you know, acceptance thing. Whereas, obviously, what we're personally interested in may have gendered implications in that respect. In other words, you know, that there is an intersection between your personal preferences and aptitudes and the work that you end up getting. Um, and personally, I mean, I, I, speaking personally now, I think the, the projects that I like to do are ones where there's a lot of people involved in them, because it's the people that make the architecture work. I mean, the most boring project in the world would be if you don't have people you can talk to about how the space is going to be used. So in a way, for me, the mute spec office or the mute art gallery, I mean, you might have a few pictures, but you know, you can't talk to them, um, you know, a, a boring projects because they don't involve that dimension. Um, but I mean, you know, I think there probably is a gendered aspect to that conversation, which is quite interesting. Okay, does anyone have any other questions? Yeah, sorry. Just out of curiosity, I'm, I'm very happy that we're having this discussion um, on the challenge of government face. But I've always just wondered actually where they go, um, especially, I mean, right now we're all young, we, in school, like you said, it's about 50 50. But when they actually, um, in the practice world, what happens, even from experience, like the friends that you went to school with, what do they end up actually doing with, um, with this training as, a, as an architect? Just curious. What, you mean when they leave, if they leave the profession? Yeah, when they leave the profession. Um, well, my, um, my yeah, personal experience, my friends have gone into CAVE, they've gone into um, public art type positions, they've gone, they've moved maybe out completely, or they've gone into, actually some of them have gone into construction, so they've gone into project management roles um, within bigger companies, um, but yeah, that's, that's my experience. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would, the thing I would add, so yes, that's exactly what I think does happen, I certainly don't yet have close friends who have left architecture, but I'm well aware of people that I have met. I think what happens a lot, because of the way that architecture works, architects end up settling down with other architects. And then a lot of the time you do have a child and it still is the woman who tends to make the sacrifices within that career. Not all the time, as I said, I gave you three examples of you know, men who are a decade younger than me who have clearly not taken that decision. But certainly people in their 30s and 40s, that was happening a lot. And then the women were tending to go part time or giving up for a few years and then coming back in. And of course, career re-entry is then a problem because you may carry on actually being an architect again, but you're at a lower level than people who went back earlier. But I think the more positive news is, yeah, I just think people spread out, whether they think, actually, sod this crazy culture, you know, I'm not yeah. going to be working here night after night, and I'm not going to be just pumping out these drawings. I'm going to go and do something more interesting that still allows me to shape space and engage with people who are shaping space. Within the you know the contracting world and the you know the actual builders because they yeah they have a really tough time recruiting women and, and keeping women as well um, so I think yeah it's 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 part of a wider issue in the industry which you know CIC is trying to address and you know there are groups that are looking at this um, but you know I think our battles are probably yeah less less than battles that are going on a wider level but you know there are some areas like I mentioned project management where a lot of women are becoming attracted to that because it is something that, you know, for whatever reason, it's probably relatively well paid. It's quite complex because you're dealing with lots of different things, lots of multitasking and overlaying of information, um, and it's seen as probably slightly less macro than mm. going into construction. That's just my experience. Yeah, the CIC, they do have a sort of diversity group, that's Construction Industry Council, and I think they're quite aware that they need to try and address this issue, but they are starting from a far lower base than even yeah. architecture is. I think women, in the structure are about 2% or something, and mainly they're 
a kind of clerical level, so they're not the people on the sites and that sort of thing. So I mean, it does remain quite a macho culture, and I think. Um, and I, but I think actually in many ways it's quite a good life for women um, uh, because you know you're probably in a relatively uh, stable organisation. It's quite a big organisation, so you have fringe benefits. You know those kinds of things. I think one of the issues around architecture is that you know we tend to be quite a small and fragmented unitary group. You know you might be in a small practice. You know which means that you're quite. Um, subject to the vagaries of the marketplace and 80% um, you know, of practices are under five people or something in our church. You know, so you are quite kind of vulnerable there and you're not going to have a career structure, you're probably not going to have a pension plan, you know, all those other things. But on the other hand, you do have certain freedoms as well. So, you know, it sort of swings and roundabouts, I think. I think, generally speaking, the industry has a lot of work to do, but I think they are now aware of it. Yeah, you. There's also about capitalism as well, because all these things are really interesting. Capitalism yeah. and you know, architect design buildings for people who have the money to pay for them. Exactly. And this is really related to business. And <laughs> Very business. much. And this beautiful to actually hear that there are actually movements in the European Union to actually you know, introduce, you know, have more equal rights at a higher level, at work with people at all companies and stuff like that. So I think it's, 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 it's a change that is happening in many different well, I mean, the whole issue around procurement, you know, which is very, very highlighted at the moment, you know, that's designed to try and lower the threshold so smaller practices can, can get um, access to those public contracts and that, that la the large bundles of contracts are disaggregated so they become smaller contracts, blah, 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 you know. And all of that is structural to our industry because it does mean that people get, get more chance, as you say, uh, yeah, you said it. <laughs> Okay. Um, I was just wondering, Holly, if there are any plans to have further chicks with bricks networking? Well, funny to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think we probably will. I think we're looking to reignite it again because um, I think it's the right time as a, as a practice. So you're all invited. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I think yeah. I mean, it's, it's, as we, we've just touched on it before. You know, I think it is. It's it's a difficult industry, but you know, I think. You probably knew that before you got into it in the first place. I think it's an immense opportunity if you like a challenge and you're prepared to be brave. You know, I think that's yeah, the world's your oyster. Yeah. Um, I was